We have uh, prominent speakers here uh, at this uh, panel. Please take your seats. You have your names here. Um, some of you, not, not the first time here at this panel, that means we do something interesting for the audience uh, already for the fifth year. I would like you to warm welcome our speakers at the panel, uh, also the fifth anniversary of uh, Kiev International Economic Forum, which uh, became the main uh, economic forum in this country. First of all, I'd like us to work with our mobile devices because through Telegram Messenger, if you have it installed, you can ask questions at KIEF, that is Kiev 2018. You can ask your questions there. And also, from the very beginning, we'll hold a, a vote, the survey. After I present the topic of the forum, we'll try to vote. The questions uh, for or contra, uh, which, which are the uh, topic of this panel. Um, my name is Volodymyr Panchenko and I am the member of the uh, board of uh, Kiev International Economic Forum and I will be your uh, moderator as you understand. Um, and uh, to, start, to start our discussion I would like to talk about the changes which we have in Ukraine in the last uh, few years. Uh, uh, it's uh, decentralization. We have uh, much more power to the cities, much more power to regions. Uh, and the budgets of the cities and of the regions are higher. They are not yet ha uh, high enough as in developed countries. For example, my native city, Dnipro, has uh, the budget uh, 10 times less uh, per capita than, uh, for example, the same uh, size uh, city of Pohang in South Korea. But still, uh, there are possibilities for the local powers, for the local governments to give more opportunities for the businesses. So we have uh, um, to discuss today whether it is important for the cities to become big and to become uh, mega cities. Um, the speakers here at the panel uh, who uh, analyzes global uh, development, they could tell you about the cities in Africa and uh, in Asia which become of 10, 20, 30 million people. It's uh, almost like uh, our country. And uh, what do we have to do uh, to help uh, economic development? Do we have to have our capital, Kyiv, 10 million people, and uh, to leave the other provincial uh, cities to be small, tiny towns? What will be with the European cities, which are uh, nice tiny cities in uh, Austrian Alps on uh, pic picturesque uh, landscapes. They used to be the suppliers of high technologies. What about uh, tomorrow? Whether they will compete with the uh, uh, mega cities of, uh, of today or of future in Africa in, and Asia? And uh, before that, the European Union uh, would be our motherland uh, and uh, Ukraine uh, wanted to join European Union on the conditions which were offered that the small communities, uh, small territories are uh, united. How about today? Those uh, territories, they are not competitive from the point of view of technology and from the point of view of organizing the, the enterprises. Um, and uh, uh, the last, uh, uh, in this preface, I would like to um, ask all the speakers to concentrate on uh, cooperation between cities, regions, countries, and businesses. Do we have to do anything about that, or uh, 
open market, free market, without any uh, obligations from the point of view of the government, which is recommended by many of uh, our advisors who spend much time here with president and with prime minister who uh, host, uh, who have been here uh, at the previous uh, uh, plenary session. My first question is uh, to Gary Jacobs, CEO of World Academy of Art and Science and the author of the books of Responsible and Effective uh, Management of Business and it is based, as we know, on uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo Divine Book. And uh, uh, this is something very far away from uh, what our businessmen um, uh, face today, but uh, you Western civilization try, uh, tries to solve the problem of uh, the golden billiard, uh, of how to solve the problem of inequality. But I mentioned not the things of equality or inequality, but the, the question of survival of uh, Western civilization. And you, with uh, trying to develop uh, social responsible businesses, uh, maybe you lose something in competitiveness because today uh, all we talk about is about competitiveness. So uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, very provocative. Please, microphone. Uh, for very interesting and provocative questions and uh, uh, much more than I can handle in a few minutes that you've given me. Uh, I just want to pick up on your last statement so I don't miss it. Uh, I, did, I have spent a large part of my professional career researching very successful businesses, businesses that were not just successful for a few years, but were successful for long periods of time, 50 years, 100 years, uh, and on. Uh, and uh, I would say that the, the formula for that has been the companies that really continue to succeed are companies that are in tune with the real needs of society. They're not just in tune with what is a, a make some fast money at the expense of the society. I don't think there's an incompatibility between being socially responsible and, uh, and being very profitable and growing. Rather, if you look at the five most valuable companies in the world today, uh, they are not just running businesses anymore, but they have become part of the social infrastructure of the world. Imagine for a minute that Google doesn't exist, or Facebook doesn't exist, or Amazon doesn't exist. Uh, apart from the inconvenience to a consumer, uh, these have become social, social systems. They have understood that their long-term uh, effectiveness, their long-term profitability, depends on their capacity to integrate with the needs of society, grow with those needs, and also be a catalyst for the growth of the society as a whole. So it's a big topic in itself, not the specific topic of this uh, session, uh, but I think uh, it, it, it's worth further discussion. If I could come back to the central theme that you uh, began with about corporations, cities, countries, and I think we could add a fourth C there, uh, and that is citizens, uh, which the Prime Minister did this morning. I, this is, I think, my third or fourth key. Uh, and I, I was very happy to hear the Prime Minister starting out, really, and, and most of the discussion centering around the people, that the real valuable resource here is the people. And uh, you've raised the challenge about mega cities. I think remember that the, the most creative social institution that we've had, in fact, the source of all the innovation in society and in history, has come from small city states that later grew into the, the mega cities we know today. When I was in my last year in the university, my roommate was from a tiny little place called Cupertino, which I knew just because it was out in the wilderness in Northern California at the furthest tip of the, of the uh, San Francisco Bay. I kind of felt sorry for him. He kind of, it's like a, a rain announcing that you grew up in the wilderness. You were in Cupertino. 
that was, of course, 10 years before Apple uh, started in a garage in Cupertino. Uh, and that was before Cupertino became the seed of the Silicon Valley, which we have to know today. And the whole Bay Area has become a mega city. Mega cities just don't crop up because we want them. They crop up around the dynamism of activity. And uh, I've studied that phenomenon not only in Northern California, I've spent a lot of time in India. If you look at what happened to Bangalore, Bangalore used to be known as the garden city, which people went to for their holidays because it had cool climate and lots of trees in it. It was never known as a, uh, as a technology center. And now it is the center of, uh, me of one of a number of cities that are growing vibrantly uh, and adding around them. So I think the question I would like to ask is, what is the seed, what is the catalyst for the growth of those city-states, those small innovative communities that they keep growing and spiraling and attracting all of the other interests, all the other capacities, all the other resources, the technology, the infrastructure, the money, the people, and I think one of the critical seeds, which was mentioned this morning, but I'd like to go into it more, is Silicon Valley started where it was because we had Stanford University there. We had other universities in the area, UC Berkeley, my alma mater. We had a Xerox Park Technology Research Institute. People coming out of the research institutes and the universities and innovating created an atmosphere that gradually grew and attracted all of the other things that were necessary. And uh, there was a lot of discussion this morning in this very interesting panel, one of the best panels I've heard in the uh, Keefe so far, uh, on the importance of education. But I'd like to stress, I don't, I, uh, because there was a, also an agreement that uh, just producing technically qualified people is not enough. As some of the speakers said, we are still in Ukraine relatively at the low end of the value chain. Incidentally, India was at the low end of the value chain in IT and is still uh, only uh, moderately on the way up. Producing people who are technically competent is not enough for the kind of dynamism that we want to see. We've got to produce people who are entrepreneurial who can not only uh, be employed, and that's why they go elsewhere, because they're looking for jobs somewhere, but who, who have I creative ideas, who have been educated in a way that they will create the ideas and prefer to go and start up their own business rather than just seek employment somewhere else. And that takes some time. And that requires a completely different type of atmosphere in education than what pre prevails uh, to my knowledge, in almost all the world, and in, including in Ukraine, even in Korea and, uh, and in India, as the prevalent model. I think that uh, I'd like to put this seed thought out there, that there's an opportunity for Ukraine, not just to catch up, but I think there's a unique opportunity for Ukraine to make as a strategic advantage not just having technically qualified people, whether it's in IT or biotechnology or other fields, but in a new type of education that's really growing the next generation to be successful, much more successful, and not just looking for a job somewhere else. Uh, I was just at a conference at Oxford 10 days ago where one of the speakers is the, the head of an organization called 42 that's just the numbers 42 you can look it up on the internet they started it was started by a french entrepreneur uh, to train it professionals they have 3200 students and only seven faculty members how can seven faculty members handle 3200 students because they don't have classes the entire course is done through self-education, through group education, through peer education, because the knowledge that they need is available in the world. What they need are facilitators to help them in that educational
process. It's a different model of education. I come from Napa, California, which is the northernmost end of the Silicon Valley. And about 20 years ago, we pioneered, and this is at the city level, I'm coming to what the city can do. And Napa was never considered a high-tech place. It's an agricultural region. We grow wine, we, gra we produce wine, we grow grapes and produce wine. The, the, univers the, the city called 20 high-tech companies and asked them, what is the kind of education we need in order to bring and make Napa part of the Silicon Valley, to bring the people, to bring the investment, to bring the growth. And they got wonderful ideas. The first idea, the most important idea they got was, you are educating students even through grade school for years to work by themselves and compete with each other. And when they come into our companies, they almost never do anything by themselves. And they, the, the number one skill we need is that they cooperate with each other. And so Napa created a whole new school model where the students are learning in groups, peer to peer. And the, the teacher is a facilitator rather than an instructor because all the knowledge they need is available from other sources. And there are now at last count, I haven't checked recently, but more than 120 school districts in the US that are imitating the Napa model because we recognize there it's not the scores on the PISA exam that really are going to determine the vibrancy of the society. It's on the development of the personality, of the full rounded personality of the student. It's not just their mental information. It's their capacity to think differently, to solve problems, to interact with each other. And if you talk to the HR people at Google and Amazon and Apple and others, they'll tell you the same thing. Technical knowledge is we can get them uh, by the thousands and thousands. What we want are human beings who know how to solve problems and, uh, and interact with each other and work as teams. So I'm trying to emphasize, I'm trying to go to the root of the, the question. I think it's not whether we should plan for mega city in Kiev. I think it's whether we can, from the root, create a new vibrancy whether it's in Kiev or in your secondary cities or even out in the, in the other areas. And I think the root for that is a change in the educational system which will prepare the next generation uh, to be the creative dynamic, build the dynamic creative society which I'm absolutely sure that Ukraine is going to become. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're... You spent exactly 10 minutes which are uh, for the first uh, sp uh, speech. So I would like uh, to ask all the other speakers to be in time that we would have at the end uh, several questions from the audience. Um, and before that, before I will give the floor to uh, Professor Kolotko, I would like uh, that the organizers would uh, show us uh, the plate with uh, the voting uh, questions. So please, uh, we have 500 people, more than 500 people already registered on this uh, application. Uh, you have to uh, get into your telegram and uh, you find um, a tiny, uh, 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 tiny circle with four, uh, four spots. You have to push that and you have to uh, choose vote and then you uh, push vote and you have this uh, application for voting and then you vote. So we, we will do like that. Uh, first, you vote uh, now what you think about those questions and uh, after that, when we finish our session, we vote again and we will see the difference whether um, we, uh, our discussion led to uh, changing of uh, the uh, opinion of uh, the people or not. So the, uh, the first is uh, co-investing, second is uh, tax incentives, third is the infrastructure, uh, fourth is cheaper loans, 
And the fifth is uh, libertarian, do not interfere into a business. So government away from business. Well, if uh, you don't mind, I try to uh, to represent our next speaker, um, uh, Mr. Grzegorz Kolotko, who is Professor of Economics, Director of Tiger Think Tank. Uh, this is uh, to talk about your you as a visionary, but uh, uh, here on this floor, uh, Mr. Jacobs is a visionary. For us, uh, you are a practitioner, you are a doer, because you've been two times um, uh, uh, Minister of Finance and uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister in Poland. And uh, your advice here used to be um, opposite to what we mentioned, libertarian. And <clears throat> this forum, the fifth forum, may be the first when we talk here about success, some success of Ukraine. We have the GDP growth, we have uh, indicators uh, better, so everything looks to be better. And uh, Mr. Jacobs told that uh, we need new type of education, as far as I understand. But uh, the practitioners like you, they have to uh, support that. How to support that? Uh, before that, you uh, recommended that the Washington Consensus is there. All libertarian recommendations, they are good, but for good countries, in good conditions. When the country is not in good condition like Ukraine, do you recommend still the same after uh, Mr. Trump started his policy? After everybody talks about uh, trade war between China and uh, uh, United States, uh, what, what, what would you say today? Do you, do you recommend uh, the same uh, thing which, we, which you recommended before? Um, good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. Uh, indeed, I've been four times Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of my great, small, from the world perspective, country of Poland. And it, it did happen because my research is and has been always policy oriented. So from time to time, the political class said, OK, you are so smart, you are critical, you know how to fix the things, come and do it. And I was trying to do it. And First, I would say my motto is that the things happen the way they do because many things happen at the same time. And whatever question I'm being asked, I'm trying to catch the complexity of the issue. And this is also a very complex issue. My first advice, wherever I am, always would be be as much open as possible. Do exercise diversification. Don't be afraid of the strangers apply to the extent only possible multiculturalism and bring the other people and their ideas into the game and exchange the views from them and learn by discussing and uh, doing. My second point is that aside of being a researcher and policymaker from time to time, I'm a globetrotter. I explored almost 170 countries in the world and in the context of this panel, I recalled also my comparative approach, when do things work and why, and why they don't work. We have some interesting countries which tried to exercise, to execute the deglomeration by moving part of administration and the follow-ups out of the core. If you go to South Africa, there is Joburg, but capital is Pretoria, and the parliament is in Cape Town. If you go to Chile, Capital is in Santiago, but they moved the parliament to Valparaiso. If you go to Brasilia, there was the con Brazil, there was the conflict between Rio and Sao Paulo, so the capital is in Brasilia. It works to some extent, but if you go to Nigeria, still the biggest hub for industry, for business, is Lagos, but capital has been built from the scratch at the savannah is Abuja. The same is being applied by different means in Kazakhstan or to much less success in Myanmar when they move the capital to 
end of the nowhere Naipido out of Rangoon, which is still the business and industrial and service hub. I wouldn't advise nothing like that for Ukraine, but it's very interesting that, to my knowledge, Kiev, a site of China, is the biggest city in the world without slums. This is telling. This is the legacy, positive legacy of so-called communism, that is of, of the real socialism. That we were able, and even you in Ukraine, which is hardly a, trans a successful in transition, it's a shame for you, it's a sex for us, but for time being, in the future is better. In 1989, when Ukraine was still a part of the Soviet Union, GDP per capita in Ukraine was slightly higher than it, is, than it was in Poland. Now it is 30% of our uh, GDP also of lagging behind process of development of urban area, yet you have 70% of population living in the urban area, which is relatively even more than in Poland. But I would diversify it. But there is the gravity. Take a look. In every village and town in Ukraine, girls are beautiful. But the most beautiful ones are in Kiev. Same, you know, about business. Same is about Warsaw. Everybody goes to. And now, for instance, in Poland, there is the also political debate. Somehow, within the framework of forthcoming this Sunday, regional election, there is very nasty regional political fight at the bad side of democracy, which has plenty of good sides, who will take over. And um, the government, and here I'm with government, by and large, despite due criticism to this government, that the government says that the government supposed to should assist the local development outside of these uh, metropolitan cities like Warsaw, Wroclaw, Poznań, Krakow, Gdańsk, etc. The opposition says, no, it is the waste of time and money because the capital, human capital, infrastructure, etc., universities, intellectual hubs are in the big cities and it is better to invest, say, in Warsaw than somewhere close to the border with Ukraine because the, the, the human capital is over there. Over there. I don't share this viewpoint. I think that, again, diversification and the kind for quest for balance between metropolitan urban areas and, if not countryside, small and medium uh, towns all over the country um, is very important. And you can do a lot. What I've done, now I'm going to my political experience, when I was in the government, I made a great effort to give as much possible of power and responsibility and money. The three must go together. Power, decision, must be given down to city, to local council, etc. with responsibility. Is it education or sport or culture or piece of infrastructure, etc. And also money. Because it is easy to transfer responsibility to the county or to the city without uh, revenue from taxation, etc. It's very difficult, it's easy to say, it's very difficult to do because there is the conflict of interest, which money goes to the central government and which money goes out of the pocket uh, of the uh, taxpayer to the local government. And then I was warning, and maybe this is also the point to make now in Ukraine as it was at that time in Poland. They said, Prime Minister, what are you doing? You are going to give money, more money to 2,500 counties, so you will have 2,500 counties, corrupted counties, instead of one corrupted government. I said, is it so bad? It is worse than you think. And I did take a risk, and I decentralized the public finance, and at the same time I streamlined, I enforced the regulation, the institutions and the culture of the local governance and the business to kill the beast of corruption. And we have progressed tremendously as far as fighting corruption is concerned. And here I think Ukraine still can learn a lot deal from uh, Poland. So I'm rather in favor being a boy from small northern town in Poland close to Gdańsk, just a sleeping township where I was commuting to Gdańsk for one year being a worker before I get to the university in Warsaw. Now I'm in Warsaw. My life is in Warsaw, but I do like, you know, the small places in the world like Villanueva in um, 
Colombia, which is a nice place to live, and definitely there's a better place to live, maybe not to do business, than, say, Dhaka in Bangladesh, which is uh, maybe the biggest mess as far as traffic is concerned all over the world. So therefore, I would advise uh, to diversify, and always harmony, a balance, is another good point of solution aside of uh, diversification. You can hardly make anywhere in Ukraine something which be, will be a kind of Ukrainian Silicon Valley or whatever, Carpathian Valley, etc. But a lot can be done outside of the biggest cities uh, where actually we do not have any uh, positive um, examples in East Central Europe, but it is still process and learning by doing. We can establish a good hub for business along some infrastructure. That is what I'm observing in Poland, like outside of the biggest cities. We have high-tech industries, but there must be close nearby an airport, infrastructure, and regulation. So the government, the government paying by taxpayers, taxpayer money is responsible for making infrastructure for business and friendly, business-friendly regulation and a cultural environment. Plenty of businessmen here, they say, okay, I can go even out of, of Kiev, but I have to access to my business and infrastructure, but also to be in a proper natural environment, clean environment and culture. We can observe that sometimes foreign investors are coming. Everything is equal. Say Warsaw, Budapest, Prague, Kiev. Where do we go? They take, of course, first of all, in regulation, stability, and accountability of the policy, but also in the culture and the quality of the environment. This is what may encourage or discourage the business to come or to leave. And now there is plenty of businesses, especially in high tech, which you can do outside of, of cities like Lagos or Sao Paulo or Kiev or Warsaw, somewhere in small town, because the technology allows for that and the government can support this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask the organizers whether we have a representative voting, because I forgot to, to explain what is the uh, number co code, uh, whether it was uh, we have only 67, 67 uh, people voted. So are there many here? So we have 67 people voted. So you have on, on the screen the number. If you have not yet uh, voted, you, you can have this chance now. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor. You, you will have bigger turnout when you will have next presidential election. Yeah, but in any case, whatever it is, uh, representative or not, for me it is. Because uh, if you see the biggest portion of people voting for uh, the infrastructure, um, can we have it on the, on the screen? Uh, the, the infrastructure almost half. And second, second biggest is do not interfere into my business. And um, it's not uh, a, a lucky for our next speaker's opinion of the public because the lower uh, interest rate uh, and uh, more uh, less expensive credits is uh, getting only 8%, yeah? And also co-investing is 8%. So, and uh, the tax incentives, 17%. We will see what will be next more people voting and we will try our next uh, speakers will uh, tell something else i guess and uh, our next speaker is uh, victor halasuk who is the chairman of the parliamentary committee of industrial policy and entrepreneurship and he is also the president of uh, the same club club of rome i forgot uh, mr jacobs to, uh, to tell that you are also the Club of Rome, and we have Ukrainian Association of the Club of Rome. But the uh, main thing which I w would like to uh, explain in my presentation, I know you know uh, very well Mr. Halasuk, but uh, I think he is prominent in uh, his uh, position, um, a stable position, on uh, 
support of uh, the government, support to businesses. The, the most known is by Ukrainian concept. Uh, second is export credit agency. And um, he also has uh, many other things which uh, uh, lead to more government support uh, to the local businesses. So my question to you, uh, Mr. Kalasuk, is uh, do you think uh, you win? You fight for uh, five years now. We have been fighting uh, for, for, for uh, five years. And uh, how long to wait until you win? until you get export credit agency or you will have uh, uh, more than 50% of uh, by ukrainian or maybe 100 vo uh, votes 100 parliamentarian in the parliament what to expect in the future from uh, from the job very good uh, job you do Thank you. I think it sh you should have asked that for our Prime Minister, because then we could speed up this way for about a month or two. Dear colleagues, when in fact it's a very interesting topic of this conference and our today's panel discussion, because really the companies are competing with each other, the cities are doing that, the countries are doing that for the investments, for the job places, and in the end for the talents, for people, for human capital. This this competition is global, it is permanent, and it is really harsh. So what we see that in the world today, there is, this is not only the competition at the level of the certain business, but at the level of those conditions which are created for the business to become a national champion, and after that the global one. The rules of the game which the states create and which the municipalities create are no less substantial and influential as the market forces. We can see that in our daily life. I will name you later several examples. So, the rules of the game, the conditions, the legislation, international trade contracts are inc incredibly important and they define rather often the success or a failure of this or that com company, whether it becomes the national champion and reaches uh, 50 world markets or it is still a startup or go bankrupt. So today I'd like to devote my short speech to three points only. One big economic problem, one big investment opportunity and several tools which, with the help of which we can implement this opportunity. Could you show my presentation please? So, the first slide of the problem or of the issue will a bit too contradictory to the information we heard during the first panel discussion, but still we should be frank and sincere. Oh, thanks God, I thought it was censored. It doesn't look like uh, Kiev. So look at this graph, at this diagram. Up there you can see the balance of trade in Ukraine. This is what we sell abroad minus what we buy from abroad, the export minus import. So look at those indicators. Last year almost minus five billion dollars or, or, or the next year's is just a forecast. This is the macro forecast according to which the budget draft was created and which is considered by the parliament. What does it mean? It means that this fundamental structural issue according to the forecast of the government will become even worse and will become deeper and according to that they are creating the financial plan of the life of this country the negative trade balance weakens the economy it destroy it ruins and pushes the Ukrainians abroad it makes our currency weaker and the prices higher this is one of the most acute economic problems which today we are having
Moreover, undoubtedly, partly it can be compensated by the funds which the Ukrainians are sending from abroad, earning that abroad. First of all, from Poland, by the way, they send it to Ukraine. This is almost $9 billion, but we understand that this is a totally abnormal situation. Can the contemporary European countries with such natural resources and wealth cannot survive trading people. We shouldn't do that. We should find a different way. So why is this negative and critical tendency happens? Two key factors. First of all, the import penetration. Look, import in Ukraine is 54% of GDP, 54%, while in the US and in China it's less than 20%, in Turkey 29%. So this is a disastrous import dependence of economy from the one hand, which also depends the public procurement. And just look at our exports. Exports per capita in Ukraine is almost 20 times less than in U uh, Germany. The difference with our neighboring countries in Poland, six, uh, six times, in Turkey, two times higher. So we are importing so much from abroad and not so much exporting there. And this is one of the key issues of economy. Without treating it, we cannot speak about the development, about the way of Euro integration in the economic dimension, about the perspective that the Ukrainians want won't leave for abroad and those migrants would come back to Ukraine, there's no point even to speak about that now, because we need to solve this issue first of all. But this problem creates a big opportunity. This opportunity is the following. If we finally become sane with our economic policy, if we stop spending those crazy resources our country has, then we will be able to increase our economy not by percent or dozens of percents, but times and times. I will name you just several examples which are rather obvious and they are well known, they will really have been known, because recently Ukraine has bought something from abroad. For one billion dollars we had a contract for the supply of American locomotive park. We foresaw a certain level of localization, but on the other hand, this is the direct impact, negative impact onto the trade balance. This is the minus in the GDP formula. Kyiv bought for 70 million of dollars Polish wagons, carriages, not to, uh, without buying Lviv or Zaporizhia or from Odessa or from Dnipro, I mean the trams. For 650 million of dollars we've bought helicopters of French manufacturers when the Polish siege company manufactures not less quality but much cheaper, 650 million, one contract without the additional value of exploitation, then you will have one billion. And what is one billion? It's almost one percent of GDP, minus one percent of GDP. Every year we buy from abroad for 75-80% from Russia and Belarus, gasoline and diesel, fuel and so on. The countries which have the tiny oil extractions, for instance Turkey, it has much less oil than Ukraine, they produce fuel eight times more than we do. And those are practical examples. Or paper. Ukraine buys procures paper from abroad for half a billion dollars, having fantastic forests and woods, which before the moratory of the woods uh, export were totally legally brought abroad. And they produce paper there, and then they sell this paper for us. And when we are short of money, they are giving us loans with the one condition that we should cancel the, mor uh, the ban for the export of wood. So we should become more sane in economic policy. And we have several levels of investment opportunity which we can open through the substantial change of economic policy of the state. Look, 
Just conditionally, this is the size of our economy, existing economy. If we include the clever policy, I emphasize clever import substitution, we can then add at least one third of a of creation or growth of Ukrainian economy. We shouldn't just spend resources which we are having, including funds. The goods Ukraine produces on its own, or which is Ukraine capable to produce, we should buy them from the Ukrainian producers. And first of all, as for the public procurement, when they procure for our money, and this is for billion hryvnia a year. This is a crazy sum of money which could be the impulse for the Ukrainian economy. The second level of the investment opportunity is the domestic market development. This is the much more systematic and long-term strategy than import substitution, because import substitution is just a tiny element. The development of the domestic market, just look at our investment needs, look at the state of our infrastructure, the roads, the communal entities, economic entities, and the trams, the trolley buses. In all of the cities of Ukraine, all of that is obsolete for 80, 90 percent, and we need to modernize it, and not in such a speed as it's done now, but five, ten times quicker, and this will be the development of the market, and we have certain tools for that, and the target money emission, and the loans not to spend, not to fill in the gaps, but to develop, to modernize the infrastructure, and it is needed, for sure we'll do that. And finally, the third point is the export expansion, because today our esteemed guest, the Vice President of General Electric, he emphasized that there are lots of countries which are ready to support Ukraine through their export loan agencies. What does it mean? To sell our products, including machine building, to sign billions and billions of contracts with the help of our export credit agencies. But we want our Ukrainian producers and shipbuilders and the helicopter manufacturers and the aircraft manufacturers, all of our industrial workers, to get the same support as they get in Germany, in Poland, in Slovakia and other countries of Europe. I'm not even speaking about Asian countries which implement much more aggressive expansion policy, which is directed to promote export. That is why a bad piece of news is that we are very dependent and our economy is very weak. But the good piece of news is that with the help of the change of economic policy, the development of our own manufacturing, export uh, import substitution, the domestic market development and export expansion, we can totally change the situation, correct it, and in five years the country will be even unrecognizable in a good sense of this word, of course. And finally, what I'd like to emphasize, because undoubtedly this is not just slogans and empty words. We should act at the level of the tools. I will name you just several examples of what we try to promote. We just push that in the parliament for it to be, for Ukrainian industry to be to have worthy conditions of competition with the foreign competitors, both at the external and internal markets, industrial parks. This legislation has already been adopted in the first reading, and it gives the systematic taxation and custom stimula for Ukraine to produce profitably, to bring raw material, to use Ukrainian raw material, to produce ready products and to sell it abroad, including. It will allow us to compete for the attraction of investments with our neighboring countries. If we don't do that, just recently the director of World Bank on our country, Sato Kahanen, just mentioned that we will need 100 years to catch up with Poland if we have the same speed. I've emphasized that dozens of times in the parliament and at the central TV channels. This is not theory, but the practice. If we create the better conditions in comparison with our friends and neighboring countries, our competitors, we will just stay in the past. We will stay in the sidewalks, economic sidewalks of Europe. The second initiative. 
last session week it was considered in the parliament and we had the lack of 30 votes to adopt it but we will have the repetitive first reading the free connection to utilities engineering networks we want everyone who is creating the factories and warehouses and anything in ukraine we want them to connect to the utilities as it can be done in the US or Israel. Because the investment component of the tariff already covers the expenses which the monopolist illegally claims from any investor. This is the strategic law which will overcome the obstacles to invest into Ukrainian economy, into the real sector of Ukrainian economy. The third point, export credit agency. Vladimir Grigorovich, you have already asked this question and we've heard it for several times. We already spoke with Vasil Viktorovich about that. This is one of the key initiatives. For 25 years, nobody could Put the, push this law through the parliament. We did it, but still the government haven't created the export credit agency. What that is? This is a special institution with the help of which the Ukrainian exporters and manufacturers and machine building will get credits with, 10, uh, with less than 10% in Grivna. Other countries are doing that. The Belarusians are selling their agricultural equipment in this way. For the French are selling helicopters in this way. The Polish are selling their trams in this way. So we shouldn't be stupid. We should have the same tools in Ukraine. That is why we have the certain funds to support export through export credit agencies. Buy Ukrainian, pay Ukrainians, strategic initiative. In the US, the law by the American is acting since 1933, and it is still acting. This is the part of the federal legislation. The preferences when we have this, uh, the public procurement is at the local manufacturer. The 12% price advantage, and there is the restriction. If you want to sell, you have to localize for 40-50%. So if you want to sell abroad, you should build the factory in the country. You should create a factory of paper, for instance, in Ukraine. This is the policy, this is the approach which will allow to break through from this gap of poverty and dependence where we are now. Previous slide. Oh, okay. you haven't finished. Uh, yes, I haven't finished, right. I'd like to emphasize that thanks to this toolkit I've named, it's totally real in a very short term not in 10 or 20 years, but rather sooner, in several years, to give the push, the boost to Ukrainian economy from the 2-3% of raw material slow speed to the 8-10% of the healthy growth, which is based upon the export, the improvement of the trade balance, attraction of investments, because in the country which is specialized as a donor on the export of raw material and human capital, you shouldn't attract any investments. Just look, 2 billion of foreign direct investments a year are coming to Ukraine. It's nothing. For us to have the same level as we have in Poland, we need to attract 200 billion. And those tools I've just listed, each of these tools will speed up the growth of GDP at least for one or two even percent a year, having the same base we're having now. That is why I'd like to come back to give the floor to the moderator now and to emphasize that it's really important not to swim according to the flow, not to hope that the free hand of the market will bring us to the island of welfare. No, it won't. We will still be the raw material e exporter and the donor of people. If we don't create the economic policy, which will make our producers, our exporters powerful and successful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to stress that uh, in your speech, you uh, presented industrial parks, which is number two um, in our voting, taxes, number three in infrastructure. Can you give uh, this uh, the, the, the slide from, from the presentation? 
Volodymyr Grigorovich, do rzeczy. Volodymyr Grigorovich, by the way, I'd like to emphasize that industrial parks are a infrastructure because the taxation stimuli, if you don't have infrastructure, they will never work. Secondly, this is the taxation stimuli, and thirdly, it's incredibly important. Again, the leading company, the international company, which in fact becomes the mediator between the investor and the authorities for them not to have any issues which the investors now have in Ukraine. Uh, free connection to utilities is number three, infrastructure. Uh, expert credit agency is number four, cheaper credits. Number one, co-investment. Number three, infrastructure. By Ukrainian is uh, number two in our voting taxes, number one in, uh, in co-investment. And Development Bank is number one, cheaper credits and uh, co-investing, co and number four is uh, cheaper credits. So this is uh, for you to remind that we have to, uh, to vote at the end. Maybe we will try to, to explain you something and to prove you something. So to give uh, the floor to another speaker, um, Oleg Fedin, who is uh, the uh, co-founder of uh, Maritime, Smart Maritime Group uh, shipping uh, uh, construction company. Uh, I would like to uh, remember my um, last, vi last week's visit to China, where I've seen, uh, after 10 years, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong, and uh, they changed a bit uh, the, what happened. I asked the other guy uh, in Shanghai, where are the bikes? Where are the bikes which uh, were everywhere in Shanghai? So you have the second level where uh, there are uh, nice cars moving on the highways, and you have lower level where many bicycles, people on the bicycles, thousands of people on bicycles. So I came to the same place in Shanghai, and I looked for bicycles, and I have not seen uh, only motorbikes or electrobikes, but very, very small number. And I asked uh, uh, the guy, what happened? He said, you Europeans, you had a car in Europe, uh, each person, one car, and on some reason you wanted to drive bike. We Chinese, we drive bikes, but we dream to drive a car. So now you will, in the next generation, you will drive bikes, but we will drive cars. So that was a, an answer of, of that uh, Chinese who was a CEO of one, of one company. Um, but back to, to our next speaker, uh, Oleg Fedin. So his company is uh, an export-oriented company. They, you can sell in, in Ukraine, but uh, you want to, to sell throughout the world. And um, uh, Viktor Galasuk mentioned uh, national, cha national champions. You are national champion or you can be a strong national champion. So what is your opinion? Can you become national cha champion, the global company which uh, sells globally without uh, assistance of government or local government or the um, city government? Uh, can you do it yourself? And um, what else you do to, to become a national champion? Thank you very much, Vladimir. Really, um, if we compare the if we compare the ship construction with us in China, I can give you the numbers that the China and South Korea and Japan, they're currently controlling 80, 80 87 uh, percent of the marine construction market. And Europe, and not only the European Union, but the European part of the continent, depending on the years, can control only from 1 to 15 percent of the world maritime construction. The world is changing. If we're speaking about the 80 percent of now the Asian tigers, they have, re have got this market under their control. And that's just because the government of these countries are supporting this, this industry. And as our already as our speakers have said, then 
the successful and rich corporation, they make the city successful and rich. Whether the big money and the big orders will come to Ukraine, it depends on Ukraine. We have to understand that the competitiveness, the main idea of the competitiveness is when the investor or the investor or the client can earn in Ukraine more than in the other countries. Well, let us then just take a look on the shipbuilding companies. Whether the investors or the buyers can, can have some more money in Ukraine, what are the pros and cons comparing to other countries? Well, first of all, Ukraine has a lot of pros, starting with that first of all, we have good natural resources in place, and Ukraine is among the top producers, the top steel producers, and we do know that the steel is a very important component in the shipbuilding industry. We are still we still have a lot of very powerful engineering stuff, and I'm not even going to mention today that we used to build the air carriers, we used to build the space rockets and spaceships. If only speaking about our company a couple of years ago, the ships, the vessels that have been built in our um, in our, in our plant, there was among the 150 best vessels that have been considered by the British Shipbuilding Monitoring Company. So we still have the talent in place. Okay, but what are our cons? What are our weak points? If we don't find the best solution for our weak points and challenges, then I do believe that the engineers who have no opportunities to build the ships in a long time, they lose their capacities and lose their qualification. So back to our weak points. The first thing considering the votes and my opinion on the votes on the question that you have asked for us as the shipbuilders the biggest the biggest problem for us is the interest of the bank in the in the loans why does it exist why it is the most thing that bothers us the most we do not participate in the tenders in tendering offers in Ukraine 90 percent of us were being oriented on the exports and we are being participating in the export. So when we have the international tender and we participate on the same level, the Polish, the Turkey, the Netherlands company, companies from the Netherlands, we go to the bank, I ask them the question, they asking for us and all of the shipbuilding companies being worked on the on the loans. And bank says, okay, it means like 20 or 12 or 13 percent of interest annually. And our partners, if they turn to the export input agency, they will have 0.1, 0 0.3% of interest annually. So there is a difference. So for the two years of the construction of the ship, my competitors will pay 200, 300 thousand dollars, and I'm going to pay six, seven million dollars. And so that we conditionally have lower wages, it will not help us. We are losing the tenders we're applying for. Another moment. Unfortunately, the financial system of Ukraine is weak, is currently very weak. And so when we, the people who are working with the, the shipbuilding and ship constructing industry, when we turn to banks, then we most of the times get denied. It is really hard to have a loan to build the ship because the banks, they say that the priority of our policies is the agricultural sphere. If you were growing wheat or, or corn or any kind of grains, we will give you a lot of money, whatever money you want. But the ship constructions or generally machine construction industry is out of our interest. But the whole shipbuilding industry all over the world has been built on loans. I have been in a, in a working visit in, in Croatia uh, last week uh, by the invitation of the Prime Minister of Croatia. We have visited the shipbuilding um, plants in Croatia, the wharves. We have been, had a meeting with the ministers of economy in Croatia, and they say, yes, we are developing tourism in Croatia, but our main task that we would like to still be industrial country also. That is why we're ready to invest and we're ready to help the businesses to, stri to strive. And if we compare our country and the Croatian countries in the question of finance, the Croatian factor is they have the state guarantees for the contract implementation. 60% of the Croatian export is on shipbuilding industry. This is the second moment that I wanted to outline. And the third moment, we should have had the representatives of the Ministry of Finances at the panel. So this is why I guess more uh, turnouts and address to Victor currently, because we don't have other representatives. Our fiscal 
fiscal system, our taxation system, when I compare it in to Croatia or to Norway or to the Netherlands, and I am trying to count it for a unit of production, then we're not that competitive in our taxation ser services. We sometimes we pay even more per unit than our competitors. Thus, dear colleagues, we'll just take a look. The rate of interest for the loans is, is higher for us. We can't get the loans and taxation in many cases are not stimulating for the development of the business. This is our cons at now at this point as our opportunities in some way, as they say. I can speak firmly on the shipbuilding industry. If we will appeal to our strong side, if the government, if the parliament will help us to resolve some of our problems, trust me on that. We will sooner get back to the volume of the production we used to have. And in the sphere of the shipbuilding industry, we still can be at the level of the developed countries. Currently, it's not a big problem yet for us. But you know, there is this notion, when the when the industry doesn't work for five years, this is a problem. But when the, the plans do not work for ten years, in many cases, in many cases, there's nothing left out of the out of the plans, just the walls. So this is the situation that we currently have in many spheres. We have lost the significant share of the GDP since in the recent years. We used to have 183 billion, then 90, then 110. But we grew, we grew slow, slightly, but we grew on the impact of the big downfall. And this is a challenge for us. When I'm here that the government tells us that we don't have the money to create the Export-Import Agency, that we don't have the money to make a more flexible taxation system, if we do not, ca we cannot provide the guarantees because we do not have the money once again. I would like to give you a short example. I've recently read, it's uh, seen it in the internet, that the banking group, the SoftBank banking group, they have started negotiation on the investment of more than $750 billion in the startup that produces pizza. And our Ministry of Finance is boasting in the internet that Ukraine this year is going to engage one billion of the macroeconomical aid. The bank is going to allocate 750 million to the startup, and the whole country of Ukraine just one billion of macroeconomic aid. So yes, please create the conditions in the country for the normal development of the businesses. And believe me, based on the taxes that we are going to pay to the budget, based on the investment to this kind of the startups, we will receive much more in the budget of the country than those loans that we're asking the IBM for. And when we will have the successful and rich enterprises, we will have the successful and rich cities. Thank you. He does not want to drive a bike. He wants to drive a car. Yeah? Um, our next speaker, uh, not the last, but the next, because the uh, universe does not have this the uh, start and finish, so it's, it depends uh, from where you count. So you, you, you may be, Alexander, you may be the first, I'm, I'm the last. So you are not the last, but you are the next speaker. And uh, I would like to remind to, to the speakers that uh, after this speech we will have maybe two minutes to express your opinion about what you've heard here, because in any case, we are brainstorming here. And um, what was planned is, uh, believe me, uh, it's absolutely different what, uh, than what happens on, uh, here on the floor. And I like that, because uh, everything w which we do uh, for, for five years gives an impact on the Ministry of Finance, at least they cannot accept now that uh, they do not have to establish expert credit agency. They just uh, try to uh, do some dances that they uh, don't have 200 million grivna to, to invest. But we will see um, even $2 billion in, in that expert credit agency. But Alexander Hromiko is um, um, owner of uh, Saturn Corporation, uh, or the, the brand name is Saturn. Uh, his business model is absolutely unbelievable for Ukraine, absolutely unbelievable. To, to 
manufacture something which used to be manufactured by the Chinese, and the Chinese liked uh, his business and they um, helped him to establish the factories here. This is unbelievable. But from the other side, is, uh, it means that uh, China is uh, far away or ha far higher f uh, from the Ukrainian level of development because you give uh, uh, Alexander, uh, they give uh, Alexander their secrets and they allow him to uh, manufacture the end product and to sell it locally also in Europe and uh, other countries. Uh, that means they create something uh, more competitive, something uh, more expensive, and uh, which gives the Chinese um, more money. Uh, but still, you uh, do those two things. You have competitive product, and you have uh, very uh, tough markets, and you conquered uh, those markets. And uh, do you dream to be a national champion that everybody wants to help you or you are on your own? And do you believe that the companies could innovate uh, themselves? Do you have some suppliers who innovate? Do you innovate yourself? Do you start to uh, uh, create and to spend money on um, research and development uh, departments? My visit uh, of last week showed that uh, the, the company um, one, one company opened in one year 25,000 uh, jobs for R&D, just in one year. And uh, you give uh, the, uh, the job to many uh, Ukrainians, thousands of them, but uh, do you think you will uh, start R&D departments and do you believe that the, your suppliers would innovate? Да, спасибо, Владимир. Ну, наше предприятие молодое. Well, thank you, Volodymyr. Thank you very much. And our enterprise is an enterprise, is a young enterprise, because we have got what the previous speaker has mentioned. We had an old plant. We had bought the strong marsh that was a machinery plant when we only had the walls in place, because the, the factory hasn't been working for around 10 days for a decade before that. So how we bought it? That is a very, I do believe that the Saturn that has been created for 20 years ago already, and we've already entered the export market, but we had more than 60 plants. There's a lot of the producers are now producing details, like, for example, the kettles are being produced at one place, the um, turvy sets in the different, there is a lot of long distances in between, in between the factories. I have been throughout whole China, I have a huge experience working with China. After we have created um, the industry in Ukraine, we wanted to have the clones of the Chinese factories and not only to uh, order the products, uh, products in China, but to make it here. And I'm always saying that Ukraine will be saved by the investments and the investments will be coming because of these very cheap loans when we will have the currency coming to Ukraine and money flowing to Ukraine as investments. We know that the development of the of the plants can be not only Chinese, but I bet on China, because China currently has uh, overproduction, let us say, especially in the southern part of China. If you want to start a plant in China, start a factory in China, then the most valuable well, that land is going to be in the southern part of Ukraine. The right for rent for the industrial land is more than 20,000 per per 100 square meters. That is how it's expensive it is. And now in Ukraine, we have a good conditions because we can get investors here, like me, for example, who are going to build here the factories that are going to be export-oriented. So that's everything that has been said. Yes, of course, the government should stimulate the flow of the investments into Ukraine. But if speaking personally on my account, I haven't planned to open the second factory. We had a factory in Kanyev. Well, we have produced according to all of the technology. We have created the clone of the factory. There's nothing to fear. There's nothing to be ashamed of it because, you know, the devil isn't that bad as it is depicted because we can sell the product that can be easily done in Ukraine. To do that, you should just visit the Chinese plant, the Chinese factory of the same of the same goods. All of the things that we see in epicenter shops or whatsoever, in department stores, we can produce it in Ukraine because already we are now situated in the center of Europe. We are now writing it our products made in Europe, we're proud of it, and our product is being bought more rigorously by the people than products that have made 
Virgin China label. When in 2014 I was called by the governor of the Cherny of the Cherny Cher 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 region, why only provide these small techniques in Kandyev? Let us make something grandiose, like in Cherkasy, I can offer you a couple of the old factories. That was the first similar. But of course, the governor shouldn't call each and every entrepreneur. So that is why we've had this investment attracting agency in Cherkasy region, and I would like to invite all of the representatives from the authorities to create this kind of agency locally. And to do that, and Chinese do a pay, have a page Chinese for the agency. Because last week I have been in Cherkasy Economic Forum, and we had the ambassador of China coming to Cherkasy. This everything that I've got stimulated, and the governor, as he said, that's, we've been hunting the Chinese ambassador for a long time, but he visited Cherkasy for two days in a row. And we had the forum created, and he also proved something that I've already was speaking about for a long time. A lot of Chinese in investors, a lot of Chinese producers are searching for the new production platform and spaces. After Trump has started additional tax fee, these are the sorts that are being, are being that's the sort that every second producer had. So if we speak about our production, when we have bought this big factory, the big factory in Cherkasa, 40,000 square meters, when was quite new one, we have already launched the first line. We're now producing the calves, the old like everything starting from the hardware ending with the software, all the technologies are being produced in Ukraine. We're going to start launch the new refrigerators lines, the, the plant itself, the factory itself, energy efficient and energy saving, and all of the products, the good that we'll offer, they're going to be the high A. A to A to A A plus energy efficient technologies for the refrigerators. But when the Chinese visited us, the one we used to use as a supplier base, they already have a lot of buyers. The Chinese already want to buy us. And I'm saying like we still haven't started the pre produced refrigerators, but you already want to buy us. The reason is very, very simple. Twenty-five percent of the taxation fee for the US in the US for the Chinese goods, and now they want to sell and buy in Ukraine. So the very simple thing is they don't have this fee for from Ukrainian goods. And if we speak about a lot of cars coming from, we have a lot of containers, we had a lot of trade activities with the U.S., and that is why we upload. So it's quite, quite quite cheap logistics to get it to the from the orders orders port their support and get into the american ports so they have zero percent fees so we have two big chinese plants that are producing refrigerators and they say you have a huge perspective as soon as you will get the refrigerator line launched then you will just have to get to the u.s market and the european market is open for us and i'm telling you this because we have a huge potential in ukraine for producing this good of everyone's usage like the every Everyday techniques, but all the same, starting from all of the equipment, all of these techniques, all of the materials like carpets or whatsoever. There's a lot of things that have been produced in China, and no one is afraid of it. Even the Apple is now being produced in China, mostly all of the details for the Apple phones. Because the support of the credit and export agency in China is a very significant. We're speaking about the hundreds of billions of dollars through this agency. That is why the stimuli is deeply needed. But when the Ministry of the Finances or the Prime Minister says that we have no money, I kind of understand them. Because if we even speak about today's um, supply, supply of 20 percent, then this um, artificial holding on of the currency that we have. We have now the crisis of liquidity. The banks, they don't have the money because we're holding the currency rates, the foreign exchange rates. We see that as before the election, why the dollar isn't growing? Because we are artificially holding back the economy. In order to have the money back, we should not ask the money for the IBF for the money. The, uh, we should actually engage, create the agency, the exporting lock agency on locations. What should they do to get the investors involved. If, for example, in the very same Czech Republic, we had the small plan, the Toyota plan, the small like Toyota Citroën, the BN gathered in um, Czech Republic, when they were offered that we will open a new factory then, that there was a competition 
between the Czech regions, and every mayor has offered better and better conditions without, like, for example, the lower rates on land. We will get you all the connection to all of the utilities and communications. We will get you the taxation fees and taxation incentives. And they have chosen where to go and where to build this factory. If we will have this high level of competition in between our regions, like, for example, we've bought the already working factory. We had always five million megawatt. That is why I've bought the big plant there, because I know that there are only walls that get inside, but then again, all of the inside equipment, there were good walls, so we can, we have um, rebuilt all the roofs, and the plant is looks as if it was built from the scratch. And we go into the, to the regional energy station, and they've told us, like, what should we pay for every kilowatt, even though we bought with all of the capacities? So just think about all of the other people who would like to have the new energy supply grid. And Viktor Halasuk, you haven't mentioned that there is a draft law to actually take it down to zero for the um, connection rate. There is currently always uh, all the, the, the tariff, the general tariff and the general payment for the energy should actually include the connection price. And like, for example, when you would like to connect to the local grid, they kind of try to think that you have to pay additionally for that. But then again, this competitiveness between the regions, that's something that can be taken away by the regions. So this centralization, now we currently have the money on locations. Yeah, for the mayors, for the governors, there's much more complicated and much more urgent issues, like, for example, the roads in Jerkasa region. And of course, they might say that definitely we will build the roads, first of all. But then again, it's much it will have much more impact and will be much more efficient if they're going to just have additional additional loans for the connection to the grid. Like, for example, you come to our businesses and we were going to handle all of the questions with the regional energy agency. We will handle the connection if you will create additional jobs. This is the point number one for all over the world, creating new jobs. By creating new jobs, we will have the increase of the taxation, the increase of the taxes income and all of the other taxes also. The development of the regions has started with the creation of the new jobs. So if the local authorities are going to experience some losses, like, for example, the decrease of the land tax, and then again, the connection to the grid, then they will be multiplied multiple times in future. So one of the recipes for the local governments, for the local authorities, if you have the money, if you can attract the investors, like saying that we can provide this kind of space, this kind of platform with a connection with infrastructure and I do agree with everything in this table that the infrastructure involves and attracts the investors especially the factories and the producers if we will speak at the lower down point with the private and private public partnership we already have lost it because Chinese the China has started it with a we already did that in shock therapy and so Yes, I just wanted, I guess, uh, I guess that the next point was what the central government should do. But again, on the local government, I've already has spoken about it. And I still do believe there's a huge opportunities and huge possibilities for the local authority to stimulate the, to stimulate the launch of the big producers, especially the producers that are going to work directly with the US and EU market. This is a huge perspective of development of our company. Show, show our voting results and uh, I propose to the audience to uh, uh, vote once again. So, uh, you know now the code U039. Uh, please uh, follow the, the instruction. You, you come to your Telegram uh, application and uh, you find uh, Kiev 2018, then you push the button on the, on the uh, bottom of the screen, you find the uh, vote uh, indicator, you push vote indicator, you find the, the application uh, SLI do, slide do, and then you vote. And we would like to check whether anything changed. So this is the old voting. No, it, please, you, you have to vote once again. Then the, the voting would be correct. We will see the difference. Because in this case, we see that some people add, and the other people who already voted, they don't want to, to vote again.
So do that, and we will uh, we will uh, uh, check whether this panel was uh, important, whether we achieved anything by by this by this panel, because uh, the prominent speakers came from America, from Poland. Uh, uh, oh, you 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 came from Italy. I'm sorry, you used to live in America. Um, but in any case, and uh, businessmen came, and the parliamentary uh, member came. Yes, please uh, uh, continue with your proposal to the central government, but very shortly, because we have only one, two minutes for each speaker until we end our discussion. You want, please, Professor. We are, we are already in uh, beyond GDP economics. So the level of output, income per capita, total income, pace of growth is very important. But I would say that even the more important is human capital. Second point is, so be careful because you're losing your human capital. In Poland, we are satisfied that there is over one million Ukrainians. Most of the time, they are young people, qualified, and you are losing them, and maybe forever. I don't think that it is as much as $9 billion in your in balance of payments, but we have had the same problem. When we joined the European Union, over the last 15 years, 2.4 million young, educated Polish people left the country. And now, for the young generation, 25% of them, they declare that they are going to leave Poland. So we are relatively success. It is not, you know, the paradise, uh, because people still of the young generation would like to leave. And this is a disaster. If your society is aging, if mortality rate is still very high, especially among the men, if the rate of fertility is 1.5 children per woman, and one million people left to the next country, there is not any prospect for a success in a country like Ukraine. So therefore, taking care of human capital, which does not depend only on material conditions, is of a critical importance. I, just had, I, I was not voting. I had taken a look, where is Ukraine? In the human report, in the human index, which was published by the World Bank last week, Ukraine it takes position 50, 50, five, zero. We are, we in Poland are, are number 30. Then I took a look, where you are with GDP per capita? You are 115. In GDP per capita, you are now between Philippines and Paraguay, like third world. But from the human capital, you belong to the first world. So that is very important. And whatever we are talking about business, investment, government policy, human capital is the first. We have to create cultural, ecological, social, political, material conditions to keep the people in the country, because otherwise, the next forum we will be discussing that there is no labor for uh, flourishing business in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jacobs. I would support everything you just said uh, as the most important message that I think we should get from this. Uh, it's not a question of uh, whether investment is important or industrial policy is important or uh, infrastructure is important. They're all as important as our digestive system, our respiratory system, and our uh, nervous system, and our brain. We need all of them to be a viable, but there's got to be something that's the driver and the central determinant. And I fully support what he just said. Uh, the, a country is not a piece of land. It's not just a legal entity or a political entity. It's a group of people. And I think what Ukraine needs most is a vision of its future as a community, as a community of people who want to live together and work together and develop themselves, yourselves, and your youth, and have the faith in that. I certainly not the faith in foreign investment. The foreign, in, foreign investment's very useful, but foreign investment can be used to take over a country and export all of the wealth that's created by it. Uh, it doesn't build 
What builds a country is the sense of self-reliance and the recognition of the capacity that you have. And all of the speakers who come from outside keep commenting, you have a rich human potential here. But the, the, the direction is looking outside. Develop that potential. Treat every person who's in the country as a precious national resource. Give the maximum support, the maximum freedom, the maximum encouragement, the maximum opportunity. Uh, and this is the way that uh, this country will uh, come out of the challenging transition it's been through and emerge as a leader. Thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, can you show us the results of our voting? Well, uh, conclusion. Uh, nothing has changed with do not interfere, number five. Uh, it, it, it used uh, to be 25, now it is 24. So a quarter of our audience are libertarians. But three quarters are not libertarians. That's happiness. I would like you to applaud to that because our um, Kiev uh, economic, uh, interna International Economic Forum uh, tries to prove that something uh, has to be done together uh, by business and the government. But what changed? Uh, what has changed? Number four, cheaper credits. We started from 7%. Uh, now, after the advertising of Expert Credit Agency, Mr. Halusuk, thank you, we have uh, 16. Oh, somebody, somebody voted now 15, but still two times higher for the cheaper credits through Expert Credit Agency. The other things, we had uh, tax incentives, 16, now it is 13. People still do not believe uh, that tax uh, incentives can help businesses. And uh, what is interesting about infrastructure, almost the same. It was 43, now it is uh, 40%. So infrastructure is uh, clear to our audience that it is uh, half of success of our business. So we have uh, another two minutes for uh, Mr. Halasuk, I guess, uh, to express your opinion about this voting, about what, we, what uh, has been done uh, during this session. Do you believe that uh, your job would be successful in the future? Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to agree to everything that Professor Grzegorz Kolodko said and everything that Gary Jacobs has said. I completely agree that our future is through development and capitalization of our human capital and monetization of our human. So there's something that is called the human-centric economy, the key concept that has been developed by the International Academy of Arts and Science that has been also added by Mr. Zagos, by, 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 Mr. By Mr. Gary Jacobs. So, and it's also quite the same to the Club of Rome, that had a conference dedicated to the um, to its 50th anniversary. So that is why this is something that doesn't need additional proofs. Another point for us: we need to provide the good infrastructure to develop educational needs to come up with all of the challenges that we have voiced out. We need economy to work in full scale. And that is why, as Eric. Ukraine has said Ukraine has to change its specialization, not to be the exporter of the raw materials, not to be donoring the people for the successful economics, but to become the innovator, the producer, and to win over all of these good resources that we have. And the third point, the key point, as for me, something that my colleagues, my dearest colleagues, has already mentioned, and both Mr. Fedin and Mr. Gromyko, is creating the attractive conditions for the investments in Ukraine that will help us to substitute this unhealthy financial donation from the International Monetary Fund and it will help us to substitute it with the healthy investment money, investment funds, because the investments are going to get the development and productivity in Ukraine, the higher level of welfare in Ukraine. And what is more important then will make our international partners 
they will take the, our international partners to the same boat as the Ukrainians are. And this is the key moment when they will have their assets here, when, when they have their interests here, and their interest is going to be just the same as the interest of all the Ukrainians. It will give us a completely different reality in both the economical and the long-term perspectives, and even will help us to regain our territorial integrity, though. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to end our session with that.